Hello, welcome to the Free Will Science and Religion Podcast. I'm Chandler Klebs, and I'm here with George Ortega, Trick Slattery, and Pafo Ortiz. And today we're going to be discussing, um, you know, more of our experience of what our deci decisions are like from an experiential point of view. Because the members of this podcast, we all know that we don't have a free will. The at not the morally responsible, you know, the type where we could have chosen otherwise free will, but it's still worth exploring how our decisions are processed, the mechanism of it. And George had suggest suggested this topic, so I'll turn it over to George and he can explain more. All right, so basically let's start with the premise that we don't have a free will, that what we, you know, think, feel and all is really not up to us. And we want to stay within the brain. In other words, like we could explore this um, via causality and say the things that happened before we were born were controlling it. But for this, for our purpose now, I think we want to stay within what's happening in the brain each time we decide something. In other words, like there are different types of uh, parts of our brain, our emotions, our, our cognitions, our drives, you know, there's the there's the uh, limbic system, there's the, the cerebral cortex, all these different parts. And, you know, it seems like they're competing among each other for, you know, for, for um, primacy in terms of like, you know, what the outcome of will be, what we will do, what we will say. And, you know, so like in my mind, that just kind of like raises the question, well, all right, there's, you know, it's not just like there's a, a one and I'm not sure we can call it us. It, it's certainly not a free us, but there's different parts of us. And, and the other part of this is that, like, fine, they're competing, but there would seem to need to be one processing center. There could be, I mean, distributed throughout the entire brain. You know, I don't know how the me mechanism would, would work uh, physiologically, but one kind of mechanism, one kind of process that that ultimately is the decider again it's not us because we're, we're we're unconscious but just just try and explore in other words we don't have a free will things are, are not up to us so what you know what within our brain without our mind are, are things up to it and what are, what's the mechanism by which we decide whatever we decide <clears throat> yeah well it sounds really good george and here's a thought here's a perhaps a comparison when a decision, uh, say, a decision is carried out by, say, a company on what is done about, like, say, for example, you know, the high V that I work at is going uh, under, undergoing construction. They're adding on to the building. They're adding a Starbucks, that sort of thing. And it's sort of like asking, well, which person um, makes the decision in a sense? Which person says which goes when it's not like it's one person, it's not like there's one person doing it all, but because there's this team of different people and they're all, they all have different ways they want things done. And I view our brains as being the same sort of thing. You have all these little parts that are in a sense competing and compromising with each other. And that right there makes the out, the end result not attributable to any one of those things. So in a sense, from that perspective, you can see how there's no one chooser anyway. I would, I would agree with that, and um, I would agree with that, but I would also uh, maybe make the distinction, because there is a distinction um, between individual organisms. Um, what you have are individualized manifestations of biological life. So each individual organism is a complete... Um, complex conglomeration of all of their experiences combined with all of their sensory input combined with all of their memories combined with their genetic memory and uh, because the the experiences of life are so unique and uh, and individualized and subjective each individual organism even if they look exactly the same even if they're all the same species um, are, are going to have a different set of experiences sort of a different makeup and even though we're all sort of um we're all inclined, uh, you know, to seek and desire the same, um, the same experiences, uh, whether for survival or for pleasure, um, for fulfillment and happiness. Um, we're we're each going to re respond and react a little bit differently. There's that little bit of a variance. Um, it's kind of like pie. 
you know, and the mathematical equations and how it, it, it just keeps going like ad infinitum. It, it, it's, it's made that way uh, so that there is just infinite amounts of diversity and, um, and like similitude, but at the same time, um, like, like personal, small personal distinctions. So like nobody, nobody has the exact same fingerprints. Like we all have similar fingerprints. The little swirly spiral is there, but nobody has the exact identical fingerprint. So in the same sense, no one has the exact same set of, of experiences of, uh, of, of thoughts and feelings and sensory input, even though it's all in a general, in a general way, you know, uh, there, there are similarities. All right, Chandler, um, so, I, I think I want to I want to go back yeah. to your analogy with the business. And I think there is a decision making center, for example, in a business, either you have like the the CEO that's unilaterally making a decision or you have a committee. You know, you have like, you know, let's say um, uh, a group of people that are deciders and they take a vote and decide that way. So, like, you know, just like within a corporation that may have many, many different departments, you know, within each department and ultimately within the corporation or the company, there are decision makers. I think our mind is, is similar, like, you know, and that's, in other words, like, so yeah, we have our emotions, you know, trying to like, you know, um, just basically expressing or communicating their information, their needs, their, you know, what they want. Then we have our reason and that could be, you know, that could be our morality, perhaps, or it could be like, you know, um, our um, our desire to derive pleasure. I mean, you have these various kinds of like motivations. And, you know, one of the things we explain in, in describing why we don't have a free will is that the strongest motivation is going to win. You have five competing motivations. You might have two that are in line with each other <laughs> that, you know, outweigh the other three, whatever. But um, there's always like, you know, whether to turn right or left, whether to do one thing or, or the other, there's always an ultimate decision that's made. And that that's, I think, what we want to explore. What's the nature of that? I think, you're, I think what you're asking, George, yeah, is what is the arbitrator of all these? Like we all agree that, that it's a committee, that our bodies are, are essentially, uh, as a metaphor, a parallel, a committee, a committee of, of, um, of, of individualized organisms all working together, which is what our bodies are. Um, and then there's an arbitrator uh, who decides. I would say, depending on the circumstance, depending on any given um, situation, um, like like you said, whatever is the most um, influential, uh, wh wh whatever is the most influential at that moment, at that time, is what makes the, those final decisions. And it's just a it's it's a synergism. It's a you know it's it's a symbiotic relationship basically with all the parts of you, and and then whatever uh, you know seems to be most most helpful, most beneficial, um, most um, conducive to uh, our well-being is what we choose. Or, or if we're dysfunctional, we we do the opposite, and we have self-destructive uh, self-destructive tendencies that that go against um, you know our reason, and logic, and and our, our biological imperative um, to to survive and sustain ourselves. Then then you have the, the deviation from that. But it's you're you're asking for what is the arbitrator? Like what is the arbitrator? Um, you know, at the at the very top, that that decides for each action and activity. That's that's what you're asking. Well, and what's the nature? For example, a free will believer might <clears throat> make the claim that that arbitrator is actually who we are. That they're making, you know. But obviously, when you think about it, it's not who we are because it's unconscious. You know, this these decisions just uh, some uh, arise. So the yeah. question becomes, for example, in one at one time, let's say you're you're on a diet, you want to lose weight or, or whatever. And and what one time you are able to like summon up the willpower to resist the temptation, you know, eat whatever. And another time your pleasure center, your desire for pleasure overcomes that. So then you have this center that's weighing between them. So why would it like at one point, you know, side on 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 your best interest, you know, in terms of what you want, the health and all, another time on what you need emotionally, you know, how in other words, like I don't know if we've begun to, in psychology or in general, examine the the um, the algorithms, the, the kind of reasoning, the the you know how this 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 central processing um, center unit, whatever, goes about making these decisions. Well, you yeah. said it. It's it's an algorithm. It's it that you just said it. It's everything is happening in in a rhythmic uh, cycle, like an ebb and flow, and. Um, 
like it, it just, it depends on your mood. It depends on your, you could be, it could be your tiredness at the time. It could be your level of, uh, many times I've tried to speak with my girlfriend or, or a family member or something. And if they're tired, you know, if they haven't gotten enough, uh, enough calories and nutrients, their brain are, isn't really functioning right. Um, they can't process what I'm saying, which most of the time they can't process what I'm saying. But like when you're tired, basically, you know, you're less likely to be able to comprehend things. So, so there's all these different factors um, that are there. Like you're saying, why can't, why can't we just choose to just be one way all the time and always do the right thing? You know, that's because we don't like have free will. So you're saying, so what is making the choice when we do the right thing or when we do the wrong thing? Um, I think it's because life is in a constant state of flux. It's always seeking sort of that balance and equilibrium. But and, and again, the, the, yeah. This is this more than one question. Another question is like, you know, yeah. um, I don't think they found this in, in neuroscience. Like, I don't think they've located a decision making center, which would uh, suggest that the decision making is kind of like not localized. It's like throughout the brain. And how does that work? Oh, no, yeah, it, no, it is. It, I'm sorry, Trick, but I was going to say it is. I, I think it's the frontal lobe. It's a, it's a prefrontal lobe. So ahead, it's a, it's, a, it's definitely a programming mechanism. We but but neuroscience hasn't found. I mean, there's so much to the brain that that we haven't found what what draws specific things to the forefront of consciousness compared to other things. So obviously, certain things come into our consciousness, you know, unexpectedly a lot of times, and other things don't. And, and we don't really have the I guess um, the factors involved for for determining what actually drives one thing causally in the brain, you know, to the forefront of consciousness and not, not another thing. Like, like you could be thinking about, um, if I, if I asked you guys to think about, think of a, a state in the United States, right? Something would pop into your head, but why didn't you think about a different state? It's, it's because we don't, we don't, we don't really know. We don't really know what causes you to think about, um, Florida, for example, uh, it, it could be a number of different factors that, that play into that. You know, it, per, perhaps there's something you saw on TV, for example, that with palm trees or something, and that, that made you drive yeah, to there's, there's Florida. So, so it's all these, all these different factors could drive to, to the thing that brings you to the forefront, you know, brings your thought to the forefront of consciousness. And that's kind of what the brain is. So, so it's, it's, it's just like a, it's a programming mechanism, but we don't know all the variables. There's just so many variables that the brain has that you, you can't really, until we, until we have the entire brain mapped out, basically, once we have the brain, brain mapped out, we can have a better idea of what's driving, you know, it to the things to the forefront of consciousness, I guess. I mean, well, so the, and the takeaway would be, the takeaway would be, can we, uh, what, what's the, what's the takeaway? Can we, can we learn to control it or learn to keep it more consistent? You know, uh, well, actually, I've been experimenting with that because, like, when we talk, when we verbalize our thoughts rather than just thinking them silently in our minds, they become stronger, they become clearer, they become more organized. And, and, and they would perhaps, you know, uh, in, through that uh, mechanism, through that kind of, like, strategy, become more beneficial to us than, than when they're silent and just, like, you know, half form, not linguistic and all. So, the, you know, that's it's well, so what's interesting? I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, George. If you... No, I'm done. What's interesting? I I feel the exact opposite. I feel like uh, I I struggle with words and I and I stumble over my words, and I feel like words are so inadequate and and because my thoughts. Let me see if I can explain this to you guys. This is this is kind of interesting. Um, I think I think in like supersonic speed. Like I think in notions. I'm not bragging. Like I have this genius mind. I'm saying that I don't think in words. I don't even think in pictures. I think, I think in feelings almost, like in notions, like these subtle notions where you have this whole collective idea and experiences and even like intentions and desires, and it's all rolled into one. And I could go from, like in terms of that kind of thinking, I go from thought to thought to thought to thought, and within five minutes, I have this like deep understanding. Now, if I try to just tell somebody just even a portion, an inkling of, of what that was, I find myself – it takes like like three hours to just try and put into words like those few subtle notions because the notions themselves, those impressions, those, those thought impressions like come to me so fast and they go from each, from each subject, from one thing to another and I can actually connect the dots and like 
and and like think in a, in a very like accelerated way. But then when I'm trying to express it, it's, it's similar to, I guess, trying to describe a dream. When you're experiencing the dream, you have all these emotions, you have all these feelings. It just makes sense. Your, your mind, it's your unconscious mind literally – like going with the flow of whatever subtle thought you have, then it becomes your environment in the dream. This becomes your environment. This becomes the scenario that, that's being acted out. And, it, and it, so you can dream and experience all this stuff within like a few minutes of time, but because there's no sense of time in your dream, it feels like it's, it's gone on for like forever, for days, for weeks. So um, what I'm saying is like, I actually believe the power of thought, like, like um, apart from words, is more powerful. And if there was a way to kind of channel that and, and, and put it into, um, kind of filter it into some kind of a machine or a program or, or some form of communication, we can move, we can make so much more progress. We could be much more in touch with ourselves and, and our true desires and actually like solve our own problems. Like we have all the answers. I believe we have all the answers. It's a matter of just distilling it and kind of drawing it out because it's so, it's so hard. It's so difficult. Language is great. I mean, it's a huge, it's an incredible tool uh, for communication, but I still think it's it's very it's a very poorly it's it's very inefficient. See, in see that's ways. interesting because I have kind of a uh, the opposite experience. Like like I have the experience where I I can think of all, all these things and I think they're really brilliant things uh, at the time I'm thinking them, and then I go to write them down and I and I as as I write them down and I um, think about them more uh, linguistically. I realized that they're not really as great as as I thought they once were just just in the thinking process uh, because you know, no I'm, because I'm putting them more in a in a mechanical um, uh, <clears throat> I guess stronger form uh, than than those those format yeah yeah the the, the format actually s shows the weakness of the thoughts whereas they did you know, just thinking it didn't it before. So I think it's, I don't know, it, it could go, go both ways. I no, no, I actually, I know what you're saying, but I like when I, as I'm describing it, I mean, um, I don't mean the, the quality of the thoughts. I mean the, the speed and efficiency of the thoughts as they come. Right. So like, right. yeah, so it could be, I could have mm, the notions that I get, say I have like, like 10 to 12 notions or whatever right. I would call these things, these notions, right? Well, if I put them in, in – now I put them in words and it takes however long. It takes me a whole afternoon and I, I put it in writing. Those notions, um, they might not be the best ideas and they might not right. be – they might not make sense. They might not be practical. I was just speaking of the sort of uh, – the, the speed at which yeah. I'm able in, in to some, In some process. ways I agree with you That's because I, mean. because I like, – like, like a lot of times I, I'll – Think of something in terms of a visualization, you know, right? Right. So you picture, you have a yeah. picture, and you can't really place that picture in words mm -hmm. as in so much as you know you have that picture in front in front of you. So it's it's yeah, yeah I can understand I think, that. I think words thing. words slow us down, but just at the same time, like you said, words also can refine the thoughts themselves, the the, the quality of those thoughts, and make them um, more reasonable and in terms of a practical application of it. But I was saying, I wish I could just communicate as fast as I think when it comes to the notions, because it just takes so long to try to explain this whole concept right. that I, that I can just, and so I'm able to, I'm able, I'm able to sort of evolve and advance very quickly, but then I'm not able to communicate these ideas in, in any, you know, in, in any efficient way, um, it's it's it takes like you know ten times longer. That's what I mean. Yeah, I you know, I totally get what Poffa was saying, and, and what I would have to say is that there are a few examples that come to mind. Like you may see this in in science fiction movies or video games or cartoons where someone has the ability of mind reading. Like they like they just touch the person, and then all of a sudden they actually see all the memories and exactly what happened. And so they're seeing someone else's memories, they're mind reading basically. And if we had that kind of memory transference, we wouldn't need to go through all these words. Absolutely. I believe that we will. I believe that that's the direction that we're moving towards. I believe that some people already do have that that ability, those powers. I believe we all have that ability. Um, it's an extrasensory type of perception or sort of cognitive transference. And yeah, you see it all the time in movies. You, you touch someone and then they – you know they – or the, like horror movies, they drink the blood, and then they have, like in Underworld, they have all the um the memories of of the person, and they see through their eyes. I I, I think the, the the fact that we're we have the ability to visualize that that concept 
because what it is is it's an extension of communication. Um, the fact that we even have the ability to visualize it means we will one day be able to do that ourselves. I, I would love I, I can't wait till we get to the to the point where I can just literally just look at you and like just boom, like 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 think like think and and send you the impression. Can you imagine like how we could end you know all wars? We could we could we can completely um, break down all the barriers, all the language barriers between people, all the, all the cultural barriers. I mean, what we're talking about is, is human evolution. I believe. Uh, I, I can't see degree, that happening. But, yeah, well, I can't see that happening through, through the, like um, a biological form, but I can see that happening through a technological mm-hmm. form. So, so once, you know, yeah, once you start replacing parts technologically, then of course there, uh, we can, uh, we can have Wi-Fi basically to the brain. But, sure. Um, so just like uh yeah the matrix like you upload you know upload the program into the, the brain and uh you know and you and you you download actually yeah you download um whatever the, whatever skill set it is with martial arts or information or whatever you learn you learn things like you know in, in 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 bit format like you know like super supersonic speed but that that's a very interesting point like so would that evolution be sort of an integration of technology into our bodies or could it possibly happen um, biologically through some, uh, some kind of, uh, yeah, some kind of physical transference. Uh, I find that unlikely yeah. that part, but I want to, I want to go back to like the nature of, of the thought itself. In other words, like we were kind of exploring whether we can think non-linguistically and, and like, you know, I think we have to, what we have to keep in mind is that our words are basically symbols of the underlying reality. When, when we have the word rock, you know, we, we, we have the perception of a rock and we might have like the feel, whatever, you know, different ways of physically perceiving this reality than we encode as words. But I think that they, you know, you know I think it's difficult to divorce the linguistics or the concepts from the thought, because otherwise, you know, if we're thinking without the, these linguistic, you know, symbols or, or conventions, it would seem like, you know, what would the thoughts be about? For what purpose would they be? Well, the, the symbols, right? The symbols in the language and the letters, characters, numbers, um, right? That 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 becomes kind of a a codified um, form of that of that communication. That's actually how language developed. There, there were pictures, you know, like hieroglyphs, uh, petroglyphs, and hieroglyphs. There were pictures of that object or whatever, and then they gradually evolved and they got smaller, and then you, you put a combination of them together, and then you, you have a developing language. You have a, you have letters and a word and alphabet, and then you have uh, a language. But there's something I want to say that was, uh, in relation to that. Um, oh, I have friends. I have very mystical um, uh, mystical pantheist friends who would say that like uh, – that the – what I would call the omnia or what they call nature or the all, the universe, the, the, the true, true connection with the divine or true connection with, um, with divinity or the numinous, it, it's beyond language. They would say that it's, it's, um, it's not something you can put into words. And as soon as, and this comes a lot from Eastern traditions, they quote a lot of the, the Eastern gurus and mystics. They would say, as soon as you try, as soon as you call it a word, as soon as you speak about it, it loses its, it loses its, uh, its power and its mystery and its magic sort of that like, um, these things are are intangible and ineffable, and there's no way to to process and uh, and put these things in, into words. And I actually would disagree because I say we, well, this is a human experience we are having. So it, it, what only the only things that matter are in relation to us to our experience. That doesn't mean the only things that matter on the planet are are humans. I'm not. It's not just um, an egocentric or anthropomorphic centric attitude. I'm saying that w- what. All we can do and all we can process and perceive are what humans perceive. So like if there is something that's so far beyond and transcendent and ineffable um, that, that we can't put it – we can't even try to put it into words. We can't draw a picture of it. We can't, we can't even um, communicate it. Then to me, it, it doesn't even exist. It's, it's so abstract and, and it's useless yeah. because we need to focus on, on, you know, on, on – what we, we what we actually interact with, and as George says, the experience itself, the experience of life, the experience of decision making, um, right. you know, the experience of whether good and evil are just human constructs. They exist to us because we're at that level and that stage in our evolution. So they do exist. They don't exist out there somewhere in the ether, you know, in, in the universe. The universe has no concept of good and evil, but good and evil exist in relation to 
how we treat each other, how we treat other organisms. So it does exist to us. Yeah. So my point is, if something is so complex and abstract that you know it, you, that putting it into words causes it to lose its value, well, then I would say it has no value to to us. It has no value to humans. Yeah, and I, and I think our words just kind of describe what we experience. So even even our words over things like we like this, or, you know, or, or we don't, or we dislike this, or, or this is suffering. Th those are our descriptive words of what we experience internally, even though if we didn't have the words, we'd still be suffering or we'd still be liking something. Um, we, we, right, we, right. we use these words as containers to kind of describe those experiences. Isn't it interesting? Like Trick just said the exact sort of opposite of what I said, but yet I agree with him. Isn't that, isn't yeah. That interesting? <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, because they're both true. Both I, I didn't. True. I didn't think I said the opposite of what you said, value, but maybe, maybe I misunderstood terms, what you said then. <laughs> in terms of value, powerful. I think you said that like without the the words or something that our our experiences don't have value and I, value. And I think like actually most essentially the value that we have is emotional. And you know the 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 the, the happiness, the the joy, the the pleasure. You know this is the this is what. This is what's fundamentally of value in reality. And all these words, all these concepts and all are just means to that. They're just like sure, the sure. mechanisms to 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 ultimately evoke this emotion that that, you know, in, in its most right. fundamental um um, manner, you, you, you can't put it into words, but it's an emotion. So I think, you know, the fundamental, you know, purpose of our existence really isn't so much understanding, but the feeling that the understanding uh, provides. And this gets into like the heart knowledge as opposed to head knowledge. And a lot of new age, <clears throat> the new age movements, um, they say that the heart itself is this electromagnetic, uh, this generator. And we actually, it's the heart's the first thing that's formed, not the brain. So we actually think and feel through our heart, our physical heart and sort of our heart chakra, like that center, uh, the solar plexus or right in the middle of our bodies, that feeling you get that, that it sinks the pit of your stomach when something bad is happening or you're fearful or that elation you get that that joyous feeling those are those are emotions those are a whole complex array of of uh, physiological responses but they all kind of center around the heart and i think what you're saying yeah is that like what matters is the emotional experience and um that's what drives people and that's what pushes people that's what inspires people uh, I, I agree uh, i just also feel that uh, the emotions should not lead and the emotions should not be put first because our emotions many times, often, more often than not, um, lie to us. And that's why we need to keep everything in balance with our brain, with our logic, with our reason. Uh, when when you say to, the heart, though, you uh, mean that yeah. metaphorically, right? Like you don't literally uh, mean I meant, I meant both. I meant both. That the heart is actually uh, – it produces um, – it's a generator. It's a self-sustaining um, you know, a, a pump that – and it and it also uh, generates um, like a, like an electromagnetic current. It generates a current, and and at the same time, it's the, it's the sort of the center of our body. And at the same time, metaphorically and sort of I guess emotionally or in an abstract sense, in a metaphysical sense, um, our heart meaning our emotions, our feelings. Even though those things, yeah, uh, metaphorically, can, I mean, we we know that uh, all emotions are derived in the brain, but but I was, I was about cause, to say that cause, causally, you know. Things. Physiologically, yeah. uh, obviously, there are these are neurons firing, you know, and synapsing, jumping the synapse, and, and yeah. these are these are um, <laughs> these are physiological responses that create the experience. It, the, the experience doesn't exist outside of of our experience, um, yeah. and and they're intangible. I, I would say they're just in, intangible, kind of abstract things. Metaphysical probably isn't a good word. Um, they're they're intangible, but of course, emotions, feelings, these things. Um, that they they have their origin, you know, in the functioning of the brain. But when we're talking about the ideas themselves, um, like like what what is more important, you know, um, feelings or or just thoughts? Well, I get accused all the time of being uh, too logical, you know, like I'm not emotional like when I should be. And then at other times, most of the time, I, I'm deeply like like moved, and I'm deeply. Um, uh, sort of entrenched in my in certain feelings and certain emotions, but those emotions are coming from my perception. A lot of people right. who are having anxiety. Right. Getting back to I'll the say, original thesis. Yeah. Getting back yeah. to the original thesis. So you have this kind of like, in terms of like one part of us, you know, values emotion supremely. In other words, everything else is serving this emotion and essentially this pleasure. 
All right, but like like you were just saying, Papa, that's not the entire story. There's another part of us that that would um, that would um, supersede the emotions for the value of of let's say um, survival, for the value of I guess survival as a species, procreation, evolution, and all. Which so you have like you know you have a, a kind of like a personal part of our ourself, and then you have more of a. a, a a species part that isn't concerned with our individuality. It's, it's concerned more with the propagation of the species and all. And right. you know, so you have, you know, so this is an example of, of like two different kinds of mechanisms, just having different rationales for arriving at their decisions. And right. then like the question would become like, all right, if that, then don't they com become two competing motivations and it mustn't there be a process that's apart from them that decides which of them is going to win over yeah and, and yeah. There, yeah, of course yeah. there is like there's the fight and flight response for example but we know that like people who meditate can kind of control that fight and flight response whereas people that don't you know don't make an effort to control the fight fight and flight response you know are more subject to that so so it depends on on their brain configuration on of whether uh, these more instinctual things take over or something more controlled takes over so people come back from war, they, they come, they come back from violence and then they have post-traumatic stress and, and they're they're freaking out because they hear fireworks and they're they're associating it their brain so they're reacting they have less control over the, the fight but or what like, what is the the rationale in other words if you have the motions you know just pushing the, the idea of experience, you know, pleasure and all that. And you have reason like pushing the survival, survival of the, of the organism. Then what is the rationale that um, that leads to um, to, you know, we we deciding one way or the other. In other words, because like it, it's taking both into account, but it has to be like it has to have a. Um, uh, decision making that's that's uh, apart from them both. That's kind of like you know d deciding in a way that, that that considers them both, but considers them both from uh, somewhat of a different perspective. That I think, I think it's it has ego. to do. It has a lot to do with what what uh, which structures in your brain have been strengthened over time, and which ones have been weakened over time. The so the ones that yeah, yeah the, the neural pathways. pathways. If you could you could think of it as kind of. Um, a really simplistic analogy might be the uh, imagine a robot that we have that we we uh, program that when we when it's when it sees something of a specific color any color and it hears a high pitched noise that it makes an association we have a program where it makes an association that the high pitched noise will make the association with the color that it sees and it says it dislikes that color where if it hears a low pitched noise. Any any color it sees, it will like the color. Uh, so so now we put the robot in a room with all red objects, and we 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 play a high pitched noise for that robot, and all of a sudden um, it sees this color red as something it dislikes because because that's how it's been programmed due to the high pitched noise. So so we bring it into a, a totally white room, and we we give it the choice between a green apple and a red apple, and it says it dislikes the red apple. But it likes the green apple. Whereas if we put it into a um, a room with uh, uh, all green things, right, and and we play the low pitch noise, uh, then it associates that those green things to things it likes, and so it'll always choose the the green apple. It's but now we right. So, but, but now we throw this robot out in the world, right, where all these noises occur: some low pitched, some high pitched, um, some uh, all these colors are all around it. And it it has to um, it brings in all of these sensory perceptions, and when it hears the high pitched noises, it associates colors and 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 balances, you know, brings brings the color scale down to to something it dislikes or something it likes. Uh, so it has all of these associations. Now we bring it into the the room, and we don't know what it's going to pick. We don't know if it's going to pick that green apple as something it likes or dislikes, or the red apple as something it likes or dislikes, because of all these variables, you know, that program the the robot. Um, it was obvious be before because we just we brought it into a totally red room and we played a high pitched noise, right? But now with all these other variables that are all over the place, we don't know any longer. There's there's just so many variables to account for. So that's just that's kind of a simplistic a, a analogy, but when our brain is even more complex than that, right? It's not just one. 
high pitched noise yeah, associated it's, to a color. It's, it's, it's everything. So so we have so much to account for. But the uh, arbitrator, the arbitrator, I would believe, I would say, is the conscious mind. It's the conscious mind is the arbitrator, and the unconscious mind many many times is influencing and affecting without us knowing it. Uh, but most of the time, the the conscious mind is the arbitrator uh, well, making decisions based on all available information. Papa, we, we, we've has. explored this before relative to free will, and you know the conclusion that I've come up with is it can't be the conscious mind for the reason I'll, I'll explain. You know, in order to make a decision about anything, we have to like um, basically um, consider our memories. You know, the the memories that are stored within that's going to like that we're going to decide upon, you know, whatever the decision is, is, is about. But, you know, our conscious mind, consciousness is literally awareness. It's an, And it's kind of like a fleeting thing. Like right now, you guys are like conscious of, of the words I'm saying. You might also be conscious of your thoughts. You know, consciousness is really not technically a data storage mechanism. All of our memories are stored in our unconscious. So if that's the case, the other the other thing to consider is that consciousness being awareness is not also a um a decision making mechanism in other words you know consciousness might be aware of you know one consideration and aware aware of another one but that's just awareness so like you know there has to be a kind of like a decision making mechanism and so then put it together if the data by which we decide anything is stored in the unconscious mind in the form of memories, the only part of our mind that has access to that data is the unconscious. You know, so what happens is like the unconscious, let's say decision-making mechanism, you know, kind of sifts through the data, makes a decision, and then at that point it makes us conscious of or aware of the decision it's made. But, but, but fundamentally, all of our decisions are made at the level of the unconscious. We just become conscious right. of them after the decisions have been made. Yeah, yeah I, wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with any of that. Um, I think this comes down to words and the semantics of it, um, is that it's, it's a culmination. It's a combination of all of those things operating sort of in unison. And as I, no, as I no, noted – No, Papa, no. In other words, yeah. like, you, you can't you – know, in other words, the, the, the conscious mind cannot make decisions. Mm. You, you, in other words, we, 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 sh we couldn't say that like it's a collaboration between the conscious mind and the unconscious. Because again, well, the, the yeah, conscious well, collaboration of all the of all the experiences of the experiences, the memories. That's what I meant. It's a right. collaboration of all the experiences, the memories, the sensory input. And, and at times it's your unconscious that's to, that I believe is leading leading you to decide it and other times it's your conscious. Well, and when I say conscious, I mean the awareness, your, your physical present. Well, Momentary, moment by moment awareness. I've been listening and I have some thoughts about this stuff. It's very interesting because, like, because our decisions are happening at the level of the unconscious, you know, like the part that we identify as ourselves often, what people think of as their self, is really their consciousness in a sense. They think of what the p part of them that's conscious of what's going on, they think of that as themselves. Um, but they're not aware of all the underlying processes. They're not aware of how fast the heart is pumping blood. They're not aware of what all the bacteria and blood is doing. They're just not aware of how the rest of their body is working. And so when people make these decisions or experience these emotions, they are completely unable hmm. to explain the real reason. Like we take guesswork at why we did what we did. And, of course, often our explanations that I think we come up with are actually right because through analyzing what's happened in the past we can figure out why we like the red or green apple more for example that was a great example trick came up with by the way <laughs> I, I do think I do think that um, I do think that we make the decisions we make the conscious decisions but listen to my words very carefully we make the conscious decisions we make those conscious decisions but we don't but we are not without influence and we are not without um, um, you know, what we're drawing from, what's leading to that decision, might be unseen or might be not, might, might be not conscious. Might, we might be unconscious of what's leading to exactly. that decision. Exactly, we're, we're yeah. conscious. We're conscious of the decision, but only after it's been made, because the decision has to be made at the level of the unconscious. Kirk, are you there? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. I wouldn't. I okay. wouldn't call that. I wouldn't call that the decision making, though. I would call that. The um, I would call that the stronger the stronger influences. I would say those are the influences. But no, yeah, those well, 
influence is the it's the mechanism that decides. In other words, you have competing influences, then you right. have decision, right. and that's this is something we're not conscious. I mean, we become conscious of the decision after it's been made. <clears throat> Yeah, but consciousness plays into our memory, right? So, 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 let's say we have an experience of pain, right? That's that's a conscious experience of pain, and we have the memory of of putting our hand on the stove and experiencing that pain, and then that plays into our decision not to touch that hot stove later on, right? Uh, well, yeah, so, but, but Rick, um, that that consciousness of pain <clears throat> is also stored as a memory. So you have the right. memory. Right. right. That's what that's what I'm saying. So, but it but it plays into it, right? So, so consciousness plays back into the memory, in which we you in which the processes, uh, the 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 unconscious processes that you're talking about, George, lead to the decision not to touch the stove, basically. All right. But the other part we have to like keep in mind is that like consciousness is very often found to not be necessary to the process of decision making. In other words, like sometimes like in, in hypnosis experiments and in priming experiments, you know, people make decisions based on on what they're, you know, quote unquote consciously dis, um, experiencing, but the, they are not at all conscious of, of the priming mechanisms that cause their decision. So in other words, like what I'm trying to say is that like we may be conscious of like pain or conscious of something, right? But our unconscious mind is equally aware of this, you know, phenomenon that we're conscious mm. of. So in other words, yeah, like, but but it wouldn't have the memory without the pain. So if, if say we no, didn't have the pain, then then there would be no memory of that, no, and in which case it wouldn't it wouldn't interact, and the, the, we wouldn't have the, the same conscious experience of it. The conscious well, yes. experience of it, yeah, plays into the memory. Right. So yeah, I think trick what you're saying is that like in order for some memories to form. There has to be a consciousness, right? So we, we we know this because people have that. I forget what the disease is where they have where they can't experience pain, and and, and they 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 run into the problem of of not making the right decisions and 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 doing things that are more dangerous because they don't experience the pain. Whereas the people who have the conscious experience of the pain make totally different decisions and and, and are more stringent on being safer, basically. I've, right. I've so, said this before. That's exactly what I said. This is why I said the necessity of pain comes from. You wanted to take away pain, as we all do, George, but this is why I said it's a necessity. And uh, also, Trick, you view uh, you know, all of nature as, as an awful thing because of the amount of pain and suffering. But yet, without it, uh, we would have no knowledge. We would have no education in any of it. We have to have that contrast to know to know that yeah, um, it's, it's still a horrible you know, mechanism though i mean i, I mean there, there I, should be a I better agree. mechanism than the pain mechanism that like pain is just bad a bad experience just it's, in general. of course it's but it's the greatest motivator there is it's the greatest motivator for uh you know for people to avoid um and you know yeah, tragic situations that, well that, and, that's how it that's how it came about evolution and, early yeah. in terms of consciousness right. and decision making though you got to realize that consciousness is really no different from our five senses in other words like you know we make we make decisions you know that that derive from what we sense you know with, with our senses and all but these decisions like you know what we sense is stored in memories right. and just like the consciousness of pain so sure we're conscious of pain because we have like this you know we can we feel but but ultimately the the um the codification of that experience is is in the unconscious so so the decision is derived partly from this consciousness of pain but it's it's ultimately made at the level of the unconscious yeah i mean, i would say it's it's wholly made at the level of the unconscious like like you say george but but it's based on the memories that were made based on conscious things so yeah, yeah. you're both right because basically we had to be conscious in the first place in the past of the pleasure and pain of an experience in order for that memory to influence a later decision I'd like to uh, I'd like to present something. Um, it's it's absolutely um, re uh, relevant to the discussion. Um, but if you guys think if it's going too far, uh, just reel me back in. I've had this theory for a long time um, about the concept of of prayer and like of uh, the religious the religious communities, religious people for thousands of years. Um, essentially, like when they think that they're praying to their god, to their deity. And then they, they're experiencing like guidance, like they talk to God and then they're looking for God's guidance, right? And they're looking for answered prayer. 
and then they feel, and this is a real experience. If any of you have formerly been Christian, a Christian, um, or any of the you know conventional religions, uh, you you think that God is leading you and guiding you, and you see all these correlations, and you like you get answers. You you have like a, a relationship in your mind, in your head, of the of this invisible deity that that you've you've created because you have this knowledge of what a God would be this idea in your head, this sort of personified, idealized notion of what a God would be. And then you answer – like you answer for him or you you would – your own mind becomes like – like like, like it, it, it fractions it, – it fractures off and you have like almost like a split personality where God is talking to you, speaking to you. You feel the Holy Spirit leading you. Things are happening in your life that are – um that just seem to fall right into place and, and answer your prayers. And a lot of that is, you know, creating the correlations like self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, magical thinking. And, and you're, you're making you're, – you're reading all the synchronicities as if, uh, you know, there is a conscious entity speaking to you. But here's, here's my the, – the point, the greater point. I believe that, that human beings as we exist, as we live, probably all organisms, we, we take in so much information. We take in everything. Our unconscious mind stores – our unconscious mind stores every little bit of information um, so much so that – if you were to hypnotize me right now and ask me, uh, I don't know, what, what happened exactly at uh, five past the hour, um, what was going on to, to the left of my vision, okay? I wouldn't know if you asked me that right now consciously. I would have no idea. But if you hypnotize me and, and ask me, I would be able to describe in detail exactly what happened because the unconscious mind takes in it, stores everything that your, that your, your senses pick up. This right. might seem long-winded, but I'm trying to get to the point. But so, so the point is, your unconscious mind actually, in a, in relation to you, it knows everything. It knows everything that's going on around you from a sensory perception. But your conscious I, mind. I, I just want to clarify that you. I think you yeah. mean. I think you mean the difference between. Uh, unconscious and Sub subconscious. Subconscious. Yeah. Okay, sure. Subconscious. Yeah. Well, okay. no, no, because that's a semantic distinction. It depends. Like subtype, you know, basically the unconscious, subconscious. They, they're both. They both mean the same thing in a sense. Trick. What, what's the distinction you're? Sub you're subconscious, like like you actually absorb it's in stored. in it's things stored. things yeah. visually, for example, or or yeah. auto. You can hear things, but but you don't consciously think about those things. They're just. He's they're, right. He's right. It's, it's so that's that's a more of a well, subconscious thing. Whereas unconscious means. The, there's there's no consciousness at play basically like you're like you're you're catatonic or you're you're sleeping you're out yeah so so let me finish I, I agree trick and thanks for the clarification like it's the subconscious mind is what I'm talking about um, so that that subcon the subconscious knows all this information so essentially when when God supposedly your, your construct of God is answering your prayer what if it's really our subconscious mind which has taken in all this information, and then what you're using now is you're sort of using the external world as a medium, like reading tea leaves or like a Ouija board or something. You're or like staring into to glass and the you know the clouds and the smoke, uh, you know, gives you your your answers, your prophecy of the future, like a crystal ball. So your your subconscious mind has the information, it knows everything, and then on some level you can sort of use the external world, like use nature, use situations, uh, circumstances, things that happen to you as kind of a medium, like a conduit, in order to tap into that subconscious information so that then now your experience is God has answered my prayer and I've I've been I've been led to do this and this is exactly what I needed and it all worked out because somehow God just knew and, and I just followed I followed uh you know the Holy Spirit. So but which obviously we know that no personal God exists, no supernatural deities exist. So what's actually happening there? This is not just delusion. I believe that something is really happening and what they're doing is they're tapping into their subconscious mind and they're using their external world as a medium and using things and, and reading sort of through signs, through symbolism because it's their own subconscious that is speaking to them because the information is there. So it does guide you. God does guide you. God does lead you. There is this, this – um, uh, this guidance that's happening, but it's really you. It's all you. It's your subconscious yeah, mind. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine if you had, if you just had like this imaginary person or or whatever, you know, that kind of helping you out with things, then then it's just part of your your own psyche that that's it's your subconscious that, that that's yeah. giving you the answers and the information because so, your subconscious so I think, collected all that information. I think they've done studies on, on, on prayer and things like that. Yeah. That that the you know the statistics are are that there there's no like higher percentage chance of of doing of getting what you want what you ask for in prayer than than you know not but 
No, no, no. I don't mean I don't mean answered prayer. I mean I mean being led by God. Like like the relation the, the imaginary relationship that you think you have with God is really the imaginary relationship you have with your subconscious mind, and you're just not recognizing it as such. You have an external projection or a personified ideal that you've created in your mind, or that people have you know convinced you of exists. And then what you're actually doing is tapping into the subconscious. But that's why people are able these re, these relationships with God that's happening all over the planet right now millions of people have these relationships with god it's really their relationship with their subconscious mind which knows all the answers and has it well so, i think i think a lot of the subconscious mind is yeah. really just brings in a lot of nonsense so like like for example when you right. dream a lot of your subconscious mind just comes comes into those dreams and and it just comes into the form of of gibberish basically yeah well or, here's just, the deal. No, 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 no. I, 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 I disagree look. trick What's happening? What's happening is your subconscious mind is interpreting things symbolically. Everything that you dream is meaningful. They're, they're the thoughts and the notions and uh, sentiments, and they're <laughs> just flowing. So. Yeah. But what ends up happening is is you, because your the, the centers of your brain that deal with logic and reason and even morality are are shut off. So that's why it's such a fantastical, that, you know, crazy amalgamation of all these different things. You guys that's got to realize the, 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 the unconscious mind. And again, like this is semantic things. In other words, there's about twenty different definitions of unconscious. Okay, there's about six definitions of conscious. So yeah. like the subconscious, unconscious the distinction, it is somewhat somatic. Basically, our mind, our entire mind is fundamentally unconscious. And like imagine like use the analogy of a flashlight um, pointing at, at something, whatever it is, that's consciousness. So like the, the, vast, the vast content of the mind is unconscious. Our mind most fundamentally is our unconscious. And then we're just conscious of whatever. Uh, Papo, I think I have to agree with you. I think we're like, while we may not consciously um, become aware of the meaning of what our, of our unconscious is doing a lot, as with dreams, I think it is, you know, it's like when we're, when we're asleep, when we're dreaming, we're processing. We're trying to make sense of what we you know, stored the previous day from our conscious experience into into our memory system. So we're kind of like putting everything together and making sense of it. And and yeah, it's well, it's, 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 it's residual. It's, yeah, there's these a, residual it's, thoughts. It's <laughs> not a it's not a serial process. Yeah, you know, well, yeah, it's not, it's not organized at all. It's yeah. it's very abstract. Guys, I totally want to respond to Papa. <clears throat> hold on, hold on. Consciousness <laughs> is a serial process, whereas the unconscious is parallel process. And you have a lot of things going on at once. All right, Chandler, let, let's, let's hear what you have to say. Yeah, okay, yeah. I think Papo's example is great about how people are, when they pray to their God, what they're really doing is they're tapping into their, their subconscious and their memories, experiences, and desires. And this is an interesting thing because people do this. Like, let's just say, for example, since it's election season, I'll use this as an example. Okay, so somebody is feeling unsure of who to vote for and so then they pray to their god about it but then um as, as time passes like something will happen where their subconscious is feeding them an answer to the question that they tried to ask god and giving them a clear strong feeling that they should vote for a person now here's the deal i agree with trick too because that answer could be complete gibberish it could be complete nonsense but the subconscious is feeding them an answer whether or not the answer is the correct or ethical answer uh, that's beside the point. The point is the subconscious is feeding their their consciousness a an answer to their question, and so they believe that they heard from God. And I have well, listen, had this, yeah, yeah I have sorry. had this experience before. And I believe, listen, listen, guys, hear me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Good. Yeah. You, you done? Yeah. Okay. Well, I just have one more thing I, to say is that this explains so much of human behavior. It really does. I really, I really want to, I really want to clarify this. I. And thank you for like confirming that for me. But I'm saying no. I'm saying that it actually is correct. It is always correct because it actually knows more than what we know. But hear me out. Just hear me out, fellas. I'm saying that like we know that the conscious mind can only take in um, a limited amount of information. We only see a, a certain spectrum of light. We can only hear what's in the immediate vicinity around us. We can only see you know to our peripheral. What the, the subconscious mind does is it actually stores so much more information. But of course, because we are we are a subjective organism, we literally could not 
take in that much information. This is what happens when you do LSD, by the way. Like your your your, your eyes, your pupils completely dilate, and you see so much more. You see these cr- crazy visuals and perspectives because you're letting in so much more uh, input, so much more so much more sensory input. So that's what's that's what's going on at all times. The the conscious mind is is what is filtered. It's what's filtered out. What is most the priority, what is most essential, what is necessary for the organism to sort of uh, get along in life and be able to interact with its environment, it has to like store all the rest of that data. And it, it can't, it, if you tapped, if you sort of opened up the floodgates of the subconscious mind, it's too much information. Or, uh, uh, sorry, in, in, a, in a different way, if you were taking in everything that the subconscious takes in, it's too much information. You would have no, there would be no, um, uh, no kind of like like order or structure to it. It would make no sense at all. So it gets it gets stored, and then only what's what's most important, what's most sort of relevant um, to the organism and, and to, to the immediate situation is what we focus on. It's sort of a filtering mechanism. Yeah, I, I don't think the brain, the brain stores as good as you think it does. I mean, uh, Sen- sensory information. I'm saying the well, sensory this, input, e- even sensory information. Uh, like take for take for example our sight. When when we when we see, do you know that we when you look peripherally, uh, when you're looking straight but you look peripherally to the side, we see color, but in reality, there our retinas are make it so there is no color. So so our brain fills in information that isn't even there. Sure, um, sure. So so it's not like not, it's not like it's an accurate re- representation of. No, no, no. It's information. It's information that the brain, that our, the other parts of our brain have to then decode and sort of uh, translate and and interpret. That's the point. But but also, also like, like the, the, the things that hold strong in the brain are, are the things that, 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 get reinforced and the things that that don't are the things that don't get reinforced so so a lot of the things in the uh, subconscious don't get reinforced and and, and we sure lose no no a lot in of the subconscious on the subconscious it, level there, it's there, all just information there's it's, actually, it's just information there's there's empirical data to 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 at least suggest that a whole lot that we never even become aware of is stored like there's a there's an example of this guy he got he gets hit in the head with a baseball right and after that day, you can go back to any day in his past. He can tell you what the weather was and what he was doing. So, he like, this isn't, anything, this isn't anything that he, like, that he had to, like, you know, just think right. about a lot and reinforce the connections. These connections were already strong enough to be recalled, but through some process we don't understand, you know, they're not able to be recorded unless something happens. And this is what I wanted to say. This is the whole takeaway. If I don't get to the point of this, it's going to be useless. This is the the entire purpose and point of this. There, there is also evidence. I mean, you can call it anecdotal or whatever, but through regression hypnosis, uh, you can tap in and you can remember whatever you were doing on that night. You can remember your dreams so vividly because it's all there. It's all stored in the subconscious mind. So the point is, what I'm trying to say is, we couldn't live that way. We couldn't function as a subjective um, experiencer taking in that much information. So it all has to go somewhere. And then, we, you know, the, the mind felt the conscious mind filters only what's relevant and important, but this is the key. What if in terms of decision-making in terms of, of, uh, of our experiences, our, our situations, we could tap in to that, that sort of wellspring of, of knowledge of what our own, of what our own senses are perceiving, but our, our minds are not, you know, presently aware of. If we could tap into that, then I believe this is the source of intuition. This is exactly what intuition is. When you follow your gut instinct, your intuition, you, it's, a, it's the, the combination, the amalgamation of all your senses plus your subconscious mind working in cohesion with your conscious mind. And now you have the guidance and the leading and the direction that you need to make good decisions, to do the right thing. I actually was disagreeing with you, Chandler. I was saying that it's not that, that, that it might be wrong or whatever. It's just – it's just it, – it's all information but if you can tap into it, then your conscious mind can actually make the right the, the right decision because you have access to so much more, such a plethora of of, um, of, of data. Of, well, Paul, of I agree with you it, that if we could tap into that, that it would be a much more informed decision because if we had right. access that's, to that's all that saying. data, yeah, absolutely. Exactly. Now, now, of course, we could still be since it's still our those memories, all that data is still based on our experiences. There's right. no guarantee that our decisions are ethical, for example. You know, but hold on, but but remember, since it's neutral, since it's just perception, it's just things that are being perceived. 
it's actually I, I actually feel that it's neutral and there's no judgment right or wrong. There's no ethical uh, basis for any of it. it. It's it's if we can access it and we have a strong sort of moral, you know, we we ha- we have a uh, good morals and ethics and stuff. If if we have um, a high level of of um, of intellect and, and intelligence and we'll make good decisions. If we can tap into it, um, I, I think that, I, I think that that's the guidance that we're looking for. We have to look within if we yeah, can, I think, if we can I, I access think we to remember, it. Our, our morality is also stored as memories. So in other words, our moral precepts, so in other words, if we have access to not just the, the, the neutral information, but the moral information as well, then you would expect uh, more moral decisions. But all, all the information you have access to is the information that you perceive or observe, even if it's subconsciously. It's, it's, not, it's not the information of the world. It's it's just no no, no. Your I said I said trick I said trick if you heard my words I said in relation to you experientially but remember something okay we watch TV we we listen to the radio we are on the computer we are absorbing just billions and billions and billions of megabytes of information okay I'm saying that like in relation to you and to your experience of course it's not I'm not talking about ultimate omniscient knowledge I'm talking about I'm talking about omniscient knowledge in relation to you. Like like what is best for you? What what would be the the most um, beneficial and efficient um, route to take in any given situation uh, when it comes to you? And I'm saying, and here's my last point because I feel like I've been trying to get this out. No, this no, I, I get what you're saying, Papo. That, like like the more it, information anybody yeah. has, the better, right? So, right. so and I'm saying so, I'm saying there's so much more in our in our subconscious that we don't recognize. So here's the takeaway. Here's the whole point. And it, without this, it's meaningless. I believe that through poetry through art, through creativity, and actually through observing through observing art and observing media and movies and films and books, we actually can access that. We tap into those deep, deep sort of wells of, of knowledge and, and insight and information and, and intuition. I believe that that creativity and art and inspiration, you know, happens by tapping into our, our subconscious mind. So what I'm saying is if you're not engaged in some form of creativity, if you're not, if you're not ob- sort of observing, absorbing, listening to music or or um, watching films that that move you and inspire you, when you watch movies, when you read books, you're tapping into those those deeper uh, sort of, you know, like they're neutral, but it's just all that wealth of information. And so when, when you're asking the, the kind of when you're contemplating and you're and you're in an introspective mode, you're asking yourself questions, you're trying to discover answers, you're trying to figure out the right way to the right way to go about doing things. Um, I'm saying that like you need music, you need art, you need um, like to, to read or draw or dance or, or, or you know, experience yeah, all but- these things that people think have nothing to do with logic and information. They are the emotional um, sort of poetic aspects of the human experience. And I'm yeah, saying they're they, just as valuable. They're just as important. because they're, they're, access- they're valuable to our creativity, but they're not really valuable to our information set. <laughs> they're not they're not they're not I'm like, saying no, I'm saying it's the opposite. I'm saying the information can only be made available to you through that medium. There has to be that medium. I don't understand That's, why you say that. Uh, that that doesn't follow. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, right Puff, I'm, I'm listening to you, right? And you're conveying yeah. information. The convey the main information you're conveying could be the same as if I was like watching a movie of you saying it or reading your poetry. So in other words, like, you know, we were all like, you know, constantly accessing this creative material. It's impossible to not the entire. Yeah, but, but we don't get we don't get like information from poetry. We get we get um, an oh, experience trick, trick. from poetry. We trick. get we get entertainment trick. from poetry. You missed, you, missed we get... the, you missed the point. You're so left brain, brother. You missed the point through poetry. <laughs> you tap into your subconscious mind, which in a generalized sense in relation to you. It, it knows everything. I'm saying through poetry, through things that inspire you, through the the emotional experience. I'm telling you that I'm a writer, and when I write, I tap into that, and I and I, I delve into the highest ideals of, of of humanity. When I write, it becomes an outlet, a medium, and so you could say, okay, crystal balls and and um, you know tarot, tarot readings and and dowsing rods and and these different things, and and like that we say, oh, it's it's nonsense. It's fanciful. But what if what if that's what exactly what's what's taking place? Not in all cases. Of course, there's a lot of charlatans. Of course, there's a lot of psychic frauds. But what if that's what's actually happening when, when it comes to psychic phenomenon and 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 you know telepathy, ESP, telepathy is something different. Telepathy is what we were talking about earlier. But I mean, um, sort of 
you know, precognition and things like that. We're, we are tapping into what our subconscious mind already knows, and we just need a medium. We just need sort our, our of a, a tool. subconscious mind doesn't know any of that stuff. Like, like it doesn't know anything about uh, being a medium or, or, or psychic powers or, or things like that. Um, so, your subconscious so, mind knows everything that has to do in relation to you. That's what it has I'm everything saying, to do with ha- with with uh, you watching a Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. <laughs> it has nothing Dude, to do hold, with. Hold on, hold on, hold on. When I watch a movie, okay, when I watch a movie, <laughs> and, and I'm moved emotionally, like it taps into the deepest parts of who I am, and all of a sudden I'm I'm feeling something, and I'm thinking about humanity, I'm thinking about uh, the evolution of consciousness, and I'm thinking about sort of these these archetypes and these these motifs of of good and evil and, and my place in the world and, and purpose and meaning that's exactly what happens when you when you expose yourself to, to art and and poetry I think, I think, and music. I think I think doing so gives you a wider range of creativity that that's that's the extent like that and, and I think creativity is important of course well, let me ask you a but, question trick have you ever experienced this of course have you I'm ever an experienced this okay if you've experienced this uh, you, you're not just you're not just your, your your greatest works of art, your greatest um, – the things you produce that come from the greatest level of inspiration, they come from within. But they yes. are you're, – you're, you're drawing on something that, but I, that but isn't I would available never... – I would it's never not use available that to your conscious mind. What I would you, never use you, that information for for philosophizing, for example, or or, or coming to something about reality. Uh, those 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 things you need the other side of the brain for. Those things you need you need logic and and reason and and you want to avoid poetry and things like that because those those will corrupt <laughs> avoid, those will corrupt avoid, those other so evil evil poetry no, it, is, it is poetry. it is very evil when it comes to when it comes to trying to grasp reality because it it, it skews reality um, it creativity not, not, skews we're reality at, we're not looking at poetry to define our reality we are using poetry to tap in to the to the deepest parts of ourselves in terms of of our of inspiration and, and our emotional our motivation for behind why we do things, we're not talking about assessing what reality is in a scientific sense. We're talking about moral decisions. We're talking about you know uh, making making choices or what 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 moves and inspires us. That comes through the creative arts. That's all right brain. You know. You know it's interesting. Like etym- etymologically, I mean, the word art is derived from artifice, which is kind of like fabrication. So I don't know. It's a kind of <laughs> Aside. Anyway, Completely. yeah, I think I think we've kind of got <laughs> went off tangent a little bit on the discussion. Though. Uh, tr- trick is just very um, cautious and weary of uh, of anything that you know would distort reality and pseudoscience and and sort of rely, relying too much on um, on, the, on the emotions. And I and I agree with that. But that's I think you're just you're not understanding what I'm saying. I'm, I'm talking no, I, about. I, um, I, you're talking about subconscious. Talk, you know, trying to access that subconscious information, but I'm saying right. that that information is only re- in- relevant in so far as what you've experienced, and it's not relevant to um, the it, information it, it, it that can, needed. It can't access absolute truth. Right. It's still subjective. Yeah. Well, what is what I would truth? say what about is, that. What is absolute truth? Yes. Yeah. What's true to, to you? What 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 is? I would say what is most relevant to you? What is most beneficial? And healing and life promoting and life affirming to the organism, uh, what 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 most uh, aligns with uh, with the reality that you're experiencing? That's the truth. Yeah, so right. that's exactly what your subconscious mind stores. But no, don't but get me I'm wrong. I... Like, let's say you're really close to the sun. You're seeing it as huge, right? Whereas you're like from a different star, you're going to see it as teeny. So basically, our our experience is relative to our position. You know, relative to whatever it is. So no, George. Not- George, uh, knowledge intellectually, you know, you know the concept of optical illusions, though. Your un- your subconscious mind also knows uh, what what what's what's available to the intellect. That that you know, uh, force perspective is what you're talking about. So it also knows that force perspective. I'm saying it, it's it's got all that. It's it's got the sensory input. It's got the intellectual uh, information. It's got everything there. And I'm saying if we could just um, you know, find ways to, to tap into it. I, b- I believe it can guide us in the same sense well, that, that religious people are led by what they would call the Holy Spirit. It, it, or if we or could God tap into, them. if we could tap into, uh, you know, just our memories in general, uh, not not even sub, 
you know, that's, that's part of it. Yeah. If we that's... could tap, if if yeah. we had, a, for example, just a photographic memory or an identic, identic. That's memory, what I'm talking about, that, Trick. That's exactly. If we had those things, about. then of course it's an advantage. It's a, it's an advantage intellectually as well because because you can use that for your, you know, in, intellectual information. Just just as long as you Trick, don't you use just, that with you the just poetic. Explained, you just explained in a very cerebral way exactly what I'm talking about. That's exactly right. what I'm saying. The access. Okay. To, I, I agree to, with you then. On, on that <laughs> but it's, it's and, just, and, it's just and, when you get into the whole poetry <laughs> and things like that, that then, that, then because that's you a have key, because you have trigger words, you have trigger words that that think you think that these things are are dangerous and they lead down a, another path, and so you have this this sort of reaction, this sort of knee jerk reaction to these things. And it's it's not so. Remember, I'm the I'm the guy that's all about balance. Well, you know? I'm just saying that somebody somebody that has access to their to poetry, for example, uh, through a through a photographic mem type memory, that that doesn't say anything about reality. You know, it's not going to help them. I think, you, you, parse just, reality. I think you just confuse the you just confuse the two things. I'm saying I'm saying poetry might help you tap into what your photo your subconscious photographic memory already knows. And that poetry, because it because okay. it's using you, you want to know the, the explanation for this because I've actually studied psychology and neuropsychology and and studied the brain and stuff. And when I wrote my books on depression, you are using all the all the parts of your brain in in cohesion. That's that's the difference. When you when you are when you are reading something, you're using a certain part of your brain, a different part of your brain than when you're listening to music. Now imagine listening to music and reading something and looking at a visual. That's how inspiration happens. You have to have a combination, uh, a, a synergistic effect that's going on in your mind, in your body, in your, in your will, in your emotions, in your spirit, in your soul, whatever you want to call it. It's all working together in cohesion, and that's what brings about the greatest greatest levels of inspiration and, and, um, and creativity sure. and well, innovation. Papa, I, Papa, so, I got a question for yeah. you. So let, let's say you separate that. Let's say you kind of like read, and another time you listen to music, and another time you sure. see some visuals. Like so, all this information is then stored in your unconscious mind as memories. Wouldn't our unconscious mind have the ability to then, at that time, you know, as you know, just put these memories together and reach these kinds of conclusions that that might not otherwise be available, you know, when we're um, when we're uh, taking it all in. Uh, no, 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 because the unconscious, the subconscious or unconscious, whatever you want to call it, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything but store the information. It just knows. No, everything. no, no, no. It doesn't. It doesn't. It stores it. It stores no. it there, and then, and then you're you're using something, using a tool, a medium, an external uh, activity that draws it out, and then your conscious Probably, mind no, kind of no, makes no, sense of it. The unconscious mind, again, it's 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 parallel processing. It, it it not only stores information, it processes it. It processes it. In other words, right, it, it just, right. So 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 in other words, any kind of conclusion, any kind of like you know cognition that we come up with, it's basically the result of like the unconscious mind just sifting through its database. You know, I mean, right, so right. Like, I agree with you. Yeah. So, okay. So, what was your question? That what well, was your question? you were kind of like you were kind of like um, suggesting that 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 process isn't, isn't um, taking place in the unconscious. You know, but we're, we're, we're my, my my what I'm saying is it's completely unconscious. Sure. Um, I, I think you're making the distinction between sort of your un, your subconscious or unconscious mind is like thinking and and, and putting together. You know the information in a uh, in a in a coherent way, and and that's part of uh, the process. And I think you thought that maybe I was saying, probably that's what I did say that the, the subconscious mind just stores everything. I'm saying that like the subconscious mind, in a sense, doesn't it, it, it it's not concerned so much with with judging anything or, or making this right or wrong. It's 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 storing everything, and then. As it's as it's storing it, like the the right or wrong is sort of built in because of your perceptions, the perceptions you had, probably uh, as you know, you're eth ethically or morally or perceiving things. It's you're talking about a, a process of sort of a like an assembly line almost, or or a production line of, of all these different these different layers and layers to it. My my main concern, my main goal, I'm trying to say that we I think we know a lot more than than our conscious mind knows and we are capable of infinitely more and we have much more potential than we realize and i believe that we we need to use whatever whatever medium whatever tool whatever we can uh, to tap into our our higher selves this well, is what people would call 
your higher self. It's interesting. Like I, I think as a society, this is much too early for this. But like you know, one of the benefits of like LSD and these like these these hallucinogenic drugs is like what they did is like we, yeah, our our mind, our unconscious has these filters. It will only allow certain kinds of information in that, we, that it can deal with or we can deal with or some part of it can deal with. But yeah, these drugs, LSD, it just opens up the floodgates of all this you know experience that's going on in there, but but we're not able to be conscious of it. Well, no, when we're when we're conscious of it, it's it's fucking nuts. I mean, we're we're, we're seeing things and we're experiencing things, and and we can't make sense of it because our, our minds are now perceiving things in symbolic form, and we're we're perceiving things in exaggerated form, and we're you know we we we're hallucinating. I mean, this is what um, schizophrenics are experiencing. So it, it gets very confusing, and it's hard to sort everything out. But it's all truth on a certain level. It's true. It's just a matter of of ciphering it, ciphering that information, uh, de deciphering it, uh, de deciphering the information, I guess, um, and and interpreting it. And the right, I look, I look back at, at my trips, uh, the bad trips I had, and the things that actually made me, you know, open open me up to uh, to the numinous and to, to spirituality. And everything I saw was true. Every bit of it was absolutely. On a, on a level, on a symbolic level, it was all true. Now, I can, I can tell you like literally, tangibly what I thought I was seeing and it won't make any sense. It's completely illogical because I was trying to rationalize what my, what my symbolic mind was, was saying to me. It's like, it's like living in a waking dream and your mind is telling you all these things and you can't make sense of it because you're not – you're not reading then, it as as a, then as a symbol. And in what sense is it true? Like I I don't get this. Like, like it's kind of like when you think of a unicorn. Also, okay, also. Uh, it's true. Horses are are exist. Unicorns exist, <laughs> but unicorns don't exist, right? Or well, channel might. That's uh, debatable, Trek. But, but the point is, what you're what you're getting when under this this drugged up state is not reality. It's 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 all these it's not parts of reality not, being right. combined into something that's unreal. Basically. No, I, but, but no, trick, wait a minute. I, would, I, would I gotta say that. this. It's, trick, it, you are seeing what your unconscious on, mind. Hold on, Popo. I want to challenge that trick. Just simply stating that, like, our physical universe, what we know of it, is four percent of what's out there. So, so like to say that, like, this stuff is unreal just because we can't perceive it. You know, that's a big stretch. We're perceiving just four percent of what's quote unquote real. Well, no. I mean, I, well, you're perceiving. Obviously, you're experiencing <laughs> what you've already perceived, but but you're experiencing it in a way that it's combining it in in a way that's not real. So no, right, that's right. what I'm Trick. saying. You're, you're saying the... it's not real because we haven't perceived it. Where you're just looking at four percent of what's out there. No, I mean, I mean, like it's like it's like like I say, combining a horn and a horse to make a unicorn. Of uh, is it is it possible that a unicorn could exist? Sure, but but as far as we know, a unicorn doesn't exist. No, I understand Trick. that. I understand that concept. Trick, yeah. listen, listen. Everything that I saw when I was tripping was absolutely the truth. Okay, but it was not the literal truth of what it was not the literal truth of what was right in front of me. But it was the ethical, moral sort of. Um, it was the it was the metaphorical or symbolic. It was language of of, of symbols. And, and metaphor. That's what I was seeing. I, I can give you little examples of this maybe off the air or whatever. We can talk about it more. But I can look back and I can see that that was my own um, subconscious mind speaking to me, giving me all the messages and telling me everything I needed to hear. But I, my conscious mind was was taking it literally. So, for example, I guess I'll have to give you guys the examples so you can understand this. Um, yeah. <laughs> for example, my best friend. This is the first incredible realization that – you know, I literally thought that my best friend was Satan, was the devil. Okay, he was wearing a Danzig cross, an upside down cross. He was crouched in front of the fireplace, and the fire, the flames were behind him, and he was kind of rubbing his hands together, and he looked evil to me. And and he was, he was wearing this upside down cross. And okay, that's what was physically happening. Okay, now in my memory, this is great because I'll, I'll show you the breakdown right now. That's what I was physically perceiving with my eyes. The memory of the fact that he's the guy that got me into drugs, that got me, you know, to start doing acid. He's the one that that influenced me in this negative way uh, to do these things. Even though at the time I did not think that it was a negative thing at all. But see, my my subconscious mind knew that it was that it was wrong. That I was I was harming myself. It was self destructive. So I'm perceiving him as the devil, 
because that is exactly what he was to me at the time. He was tempting me. He was leading me. Do you understand? In a symbolic way, that's exactly who he was. I can go on. I had a, I had a, there was a girl, uh, she's, she's looking at me through like the screen door and she's like sticking her tongue out and she's like, she's like, come here, Papa. She's like, I want to fuck you. I want to fuck you. And she's sticking her tongue out and I'm like, Ugh. I'm like scared of her. And I'm like, she's lust. She's the spirit of lust. She's the demon. She's like the succubus, you know, she's like Lilith. Okay, because this was a girl who was like a nymphomaniac and she was just like a slut. And that's what she represented. Everything became like like a personified representation like of, of who they really were. But I literally thought that's you gotta understand this is the, the horror, the nightmare of it. I'm looking at this human being thinking that they really are a demon sitting in front of me. I thought that my best friend who I, whom I trusted was the devil and this and all my friends were demons. Okay. Uh, continuing on, I'm I'm up on a balcony. This is what's physically happening. I'm I'm sort of like in a trance state, and I'm I'm like just swaying back and forth. And I look, and I feel like I'm caught between heaven and hell. I feel like I'm I'm, I'm being pulled toward this this like ethereal like place. And I look, and I see like the beach and the ocean front and all the hotels, and it's all lit up, and it's like it's beautiful. It's like it's rainbow colored. And then towards the other side, I see like this this dark, gloomy, dismal. Um, sort of there's like bushes and, and bramble weeds and it's just, and I hear I would always hear like this frog croaking over there and it always creeped me out. So my memories are playing into it where I was always a little bit creeped out by that area and that becomes hell. So I'm trapped between heaven and hell and in the, in the moment I'm literally thinking that I'm dead and I'm in this afterlife. I'm in this like supernatural sort of uh, like purgatory world where I'm trapped between heaven and hell. Okay, and I'm like begging God to just like save me and like rescue me from all this. I got a friend um, who who was wearing like a dark black hood, and and he uh, was kind of like a follower, and he he had like a really low self esteem, and he had hung out with us and stuff because you know whatever we were like the cool kids. And I kept asking my mom. This is the night I got busted for tripping acid. Actually, it all it all kind of exploded because. It was the night before Thanksgiving, and my mom basically found out that I was doing drugs um, because I was having this horrible, this bad trip, you know. Um, so I'm asking, "Where's Kenny? Where did where he go?" Where? And she keeps saying to me, "He went home. He went home. Kenny went home. He's he's with his family now." And I'm like, "Oh God, he's dead. He's 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 gone. He's gone home. He's because what I remember was how sort of weak willed he was, and he was wearing like the black hood, like like a death shroud. And so my mind interpreted it, and so." Was it true that he actually literally died? No, but it was true that that he was sort of dead inside. And he, yes. So basically, you know, what, you're, what you're saying what, with all that, what you're basically saying is that the drugs kind of created an amplification, an amplification, amplification effect on the, on the things of, of the that's realities. already in your subconscious. Right. But God, that are God, already I, in your, I like to. Uh, Hold on, hold on, Papa. Relative yeah. to, what, to what we're talking about in terms of like you know like we think we hear God, but it's really a part of us. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with DMT because the difference between DMT and LSD and, and these other like hallucinogenic psychotropic drugs is like with DMT, the common experience is that you are talking, literally interacting with mushrooms or literally interacting with these beings. They are talking, you are conversing with them. So, and the, the thing about DMT, unlike perhaps LSD and some other kinds of chemicals, is that it's a natural substance that occurs in our brain. So this this you know this chemical explains our our religious experience. It naturally is coming from within us. But you know, in other words, when people are like talking to these beings, whether it's God or Jesus, whoever, you know, there's a kind of like there's a real part of it that's really happening. But again, it's not within the four percent of reality that we understand. So actually, do you believe, uh, George, that you know DMT is sort of an access, uh, sort of a gateway, a portal to uh, alternate dimensions, or do you believe it's just a portal to like the truth? Like, so that, like I was saying, like these figures would come to you. They're just really, um, sort of personifications of your subconscious, like speaking right. to you, or you believe these, these figures are real. Are you saying that they're real? I, th I think they are quote unquote real, but I wouldn't use the word dimension. Cause I, I like to be literal about dimension. In other words, there's three dimensions, you know, and then maybe the dimension of time. So it, it's, it, they're more, it's a different realm. In other words, like we are, we have this common conscious experience that we can all relate to. And it's probably related to the plants we've eaten for hundreds of thousands of years and all. And that's our common experience of reality. So I think, yes, I think this other stuff is real, but it's very uncommon. It's just that we don't have much experience with it. Chad, I don't know why, why we would even suggest it was real. We, I because would think it would be a, a, hallucination, I a hallucination or either that or Rick, just, going, just a subconscious. Going back, to that, 
I'm going back to that basic fact that we we see, you know, with our science, we're basically looking at four percent of reality. So we can't determine the nature yeah, of but, reality. But you don't base just looking you at don't 4%. base personal experiences unless they can be verified. Subjective experiences, and, and, yeah. Yeah, subjective experiences unless they can be some in some way verified intersubjectively. Um, then then you have to kind of say, you know. That's probably not the case. That's probably not true. I won't. I won't comment on this because um, I. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to hold a position on it because I feel in 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 this case uh, I, I would agree with Trick that we need sort of the uh, we need the verifiable demonstrable evidence of but this. But guys, you got to understand. And it's still, our, our, but at the same science. time, I, I know. But listen, at the same time, I would say that we should absolutely explore. These experiences and under observation, like test somebody, like have them uh, smoke DMT and let's like actually document what they see and let them write it down and videotape them. Why aren't we exploring this? So right. I'm all about getting to the bottom, getting to the core of it because I'm open to it, but I'm not going right. to teach well, it, saying, promote exactly, it but, because but until we, we have, you know, we can't just like basically solid evidence. Say it's not happening because again, like our scientific sure. method is constrained by the 4% of reality that it can like interact with. Uh, so, You're right. So, You're right, George. We shouldn't say it's not happening, but at the same time, we shouldn't say it's happening. Like, we, like we shouldn't, we shouldn't believe that it's a, it's a true thing. All right, with, with with this DMT conversations, right? All right, fine. We can't say for sure that that a person, let's say, takes DMT and is talking to a mushroom, right? But I think what we can say for sure is that the interaction, the conversation, is taking place. Yeah. What we can say is 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 if we were going to put them under an MRI. They'd have different brain processes going on in their brain, and and, that, and those different brain processes are what output these experiences. So, okay, yeah, now here's an idea, brain, guys. Okay, here's a real for you know again trick with with our with our brain. You know we're we I'm sitting this one out. Accessing four percent of our of our brain's reality. You know, so again, if we can't see something, if you're looking into into a room and you're only looking into four percent of it, and you're saying you can't, you're not finding anything. I think the logic that underlies science will tell you, well, no, you can't really conclusively say that it's not there if you've just yeah, but but 4%. but but science science kind of says that that the way we observe things is through senses. <laughs> so so we have you know our five senses. We we don't observe communicate. We don't communicate with people verbally, for example. <laughs> But that's, uh, that's, that's in, our in, inside the brain, example. like, 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 are these, <laughs> how does even that even like, work? Trick, can we agree? Hey, can I say something? Like, can I interject? Can I interject? Of, hold uh, on. If our sense of sight is okay. like you're saying, we, we perceive what we sense, our, our, our visual, you know, limitation within the, the, the spectrum of light is minuscule. So there's a can whole I say, can I say that we're that we, sensing that it's out there. Can I say that we, we should not, can I say that we should not go around espousing and teaching uh, that mushrooms speak to us or that these interdimensional or whatever you want to call them, these beings exist, but we should, we should take into account the, um, we should take into account, um, the cases and we should follow up on each case individually and we should investigate it and explore it. I think we should be right. open to, to investigating it, but I don't think that we should, we should let, a, let our worldview, um, be built on, on subjective experience. So I think there should, should be a balance because no, if you were to ask me, Back then, I would have told you, my friend Ben Kentowski is the devil. I would have told, I thought yeah. that, and I had many other experiences where I thought I was encountering angels because that was the context of my sort of my pre. Yeah, uh, so I would I would say that that was like an, that was like an yeah. amplification effect that, that it was happening. And I wasn't even so, religious. I wasn't even a Christian. We, that we, it, we can we can, an, we can draw an analogy. Residual. In other words, like our senses tell us that the tables are solid, that the floor underneath is solid, right? But our science and physics tells us no, it's much more empty space. So yeah, it, just like with our physical perception of our physical reality, it's much different than what it seems. Then yes, I you know it maybe it wasn't mushrooms that they were communicating with or whatever. But the, there's a certain real uh, element of this experience. Well, you know, there's experience a certain reality. Yeah, let's, let's, put, let's put this in a different a different way, George. Yeah. Um, blind people. Uh, blind people that are blind from since birth, that they've never experienced, for example, color and things like that. If you put them under DMT or whatever, they're not going to experience color because they don't have the associated brain uh, configurations. The reason you under DMT would have these brain configurations of, of, of these communicated uh, beings is because you've experienced people, you know, similar type things. And, and, and it I makes hate to throw a this, but I've, uh, I've actually heard of, of, of near death experiences and out of body experiences where people who are blind 
do experience color. I, the near death experiences, um, NDEs, where people who've been blind since birth come back describing. No, the, that's not true. That's colors. Not true. You have to. You have to give Anic- me the stats on that one. Maybe, I, I, maybe I can guarantee that I'm, you I'm that's saying, not. I I'm just saying I've I've you know I've heard these stories so. Okay. Well. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see that for pe- people that are were you know once sighted but now are blind. But not when if they're blind since birth. Well, like I said, like I said, what does it lead to? If it leads to believing in in, in a supernatural world or an afterlife, well, I don't want to believe that or teach that or have false hope in that unless there is evidence for it. So again, I'm I'm just more balanced when it when it comes to all this stuff. Well, what I was trying to say was just like Joseph Campbell would say, all religions are true, but none are literal. So what I was seeing was true. But I, 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 it screwed me up, and I was terribly traumatized because I was taking it literally. The moral of this story is, boys and girls, don't do drugs. <laughs> do drugs. <laughs> so <laughs> drugs can amplify and can help you tune in to deeper aspects of your consciousness and, and deeper aspects of your own rea- reality. It can, it can tell you the truth about what's going on, but if you're not strong enough to handle that and understand that symbolic language, then you're, you're going to be lost and lost in the, uh, in the metaphor, which is exactly a good parallel for what the religious communities are. They're lost in the metaphor. They've literalized uh, what probably could be taken um, as metaphor and instead view it as actual history. This is but a great, it, but um, it would just be symbolic yeah. of your own uh, subjective experience. So, so, so it doesn't oh, well, mean these, that well, these archetypes these archetypes doesn't mean your universal. subjective experience is correct. Same yeah. thing with religion. Like, like you say, you say it's 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 correct not, for, not it's literal, correct for me, but it doesn't not, mean that not yeah. correct. Like, like <sighs> that that um, girl here. There's one more. There was a girl named Misty. Isn't that funny? That's her name, Misty, like mystical. Um, this this all tied into it as well. This is like the, the symbolism of it. I had a crush on her at the time, okay? And she was there that night, and I looked at her, and I felt like she represented – no, I didn't feel like she represented anything because I wasn't, I wasn't thinking in a logical way. I, I looked at her, and I thought that she was the acid. I was like, she's the acid. <laughs> she's the one that's like the mystical – temptress like the goddess and then and years later i look back and i say holy shit because i was in love with the acid that was my drug of choice that was like my go-to thing that was my experience and and i had this huge crush on misty and i was like in love with her it makes perfect sense like that's why well, she i also think brains that. kind of make make associations too like like that's it's exactly just kind how, of a natural process of brains to make associations that's how we, that, that's that how aren't we, really that's there how language that's how language that's how we interpret language it's exactly how we interpret the signs so when god is speaking to us it's probably us speaking to us it's probably our subconscious mind speaking to us using the language of symbolism that that's yeah, but, my but whole it could point. have been it could have been some other subconscious thing that's coming to the forefront but you're, yet you're making an association with this other thing so so it, we don't know that it's just it's just you're making an association because that's what brains do they they make they just make no i'm saying no i'm saying trick i literally thought i literally believed that these people were demons and angels and i thought i was dead I literally thought I was trapped. I know, I know, and I'm saying you I don't know why those are coming to the forefront later. of your of your consciousness. You don't you don't understand that that you're 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 making the association that it's coming to the to the forefront of your consciousness as that because of this association that you're thinking of. But but you don't because you don't know the, that. That was you're the, just because making that, that association is what I'm saying, dude. Because I'm telling you that in my experience in my life. The beach was a happy place for me. I was scared of that 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 wooded area off to the side, to the left. Uh, like like the, these people did represent. They, that's exactly what these people were to me. So the strongest way that my own conscience could speak to me and tell me that what I was doing was wrong, that that drugs were bad. The strongest way that God, which is nature to me, could speak to me was through this this powerful use of symbolism using the the Judeo Christian um, motifs yep. and and, but I'm and saying- archetypes. What I'm saying is, is if you got the reverse, like the reverse experience from from the drugs, for example, for, of those people, you would make a different association with that reverse. Um, so what you're saying, what you're assessment. saying is, again, is it's completely arbitrary that no matter what symbolic message you I'm get, saying is that it, there's a good chance, there's a good chance that you're making an association that that we we're not sure is really the real association that, sh- that should be made. I'm telling you, I don't know why you're still doubting. I'm telling you that that was my subconscious mind speaking to me. That everything I saw was the truth. Uh, I was messed up for a long time, you know, because I literally believed these things because I didn't understand yet that that's what acid does. That's what LSD does. It it amplifies and it speaks to you, you know, symbolically. 
uh, because I was beyond like the visuals and stuff. Like I, I, that didn't, I didn't affect me anymore. I was thinking differently. I was thinking I know. on a fun. But, 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 but what level. I'm saying is if you got a different experience, you'd, you'd associate that differently and you, and you'd find a different thing to associate it with. So, so you'd, so either way you're going to make an association and you'd say, Oh, then it's the truth because I'm making this association with, with the, the, the different experience. It's, it's just, I understand, what, our I understand what you're, I understand what you're saying. But like in relation to me, like it, it wasn't arbitrary because that's who those people really were to me. I'm not, I'm not reinterpreting it like years later. I'm understanding what I was seeing now. Like it, I just didn't understand it at the time that, that it was a powerful way for my own uh, mind, for, for nature within me to like, basically let, let's speak. Say, to let's say you, you, the, the person that you saw as the devil, you saw as uh, rather than the devil as, as somebody, you know what, you know what? Hold somebody on, I compelling, I, dude, somebody, somebody I really you listen, appreciate. Listen you can, you can then associate later and say, ah, Trick. but it's, it's really someone Trick. trying to fool you. You know, Trick. you can this, make any kind of associations you want there. Correct. Trick. This is this is the insane part. I don't know if this is gonna help or hurt my case. A week before that, a week before that, when I was coming down off an acid trip, I thought that same friend was God. I literally thought that he was God, and he was encouraging me to to continue to pursue my art career. And I was coming down off of a trip all night, and he was he was speaking to me, and it was because he was sort of like kind and encouraging and looking into his eyes. I literally believe that this man. I, I don't know why I thought that at the time. It made no sense to me. I literally thought that God had taken over my friend's body and was speaking to me through my friend. Okay. And now then imagine, was, how, imagine how amazing this was. Imagine how fucking like disrupting and, and unsettling this was a week later that I rec I realized he's actually the devil. And, and <laughs> that threw me, uh, I mean, anyway, <laughs> well, wait a minute, Papo, like what, what yeah. we learned from this whole free will thing is that like, if nothing is up to us, then whatever it, it, everything is up to is both perfect good and, and perfect evil. So like your friend was at that time, you know, you're, you're from that, a certain perspective, you were seeing the evil in him at a different time, mm -hmm. from a different perspective, you were seeing the good. It, it's exactly. not contradictory. And it was just, it was just amplified. It was amplified to the greatest degree that it could possibly be amplified. The, the, the strongest point of reference of, of the two polarity system of God and the devil. That's literally what I encountered. And I literally believed he was standing right in front of me. Can you imagine, do you know what it's like um, sitting in front of a person who you think knows everything about you, has seen you your entire life, your concept of what God is, and knows everything is all powerful and is now speaking intimately directly to you and, and they know everything. The first thing you feel is embarrassment because it's like someone that's, that knows everything about you has watched you, seen you do all the things you've done behind closed doors or, or knows your thoughts, knows, can read your mind. That is an, an incredible vulnerability. And, and then you have this humbling experience where all you want to do is like ask them questions and, and understand things and know why. And every question I asked him, the, the first encounter when I thought he was God, every question I asked him he answered me in like a cryptic way and then my mind interpreted it and it made sense. Like it, it all made sense. It was amazing. And this is my, my whole point of how the subconscious mind could possibly – for people who aren't doing drugs but they're just having a religious experience by interpreting reality, uh, listen, reading the signs, looking for answers and, and using experiences and events and circumstances to speak to them. Well, they're, they're listening to their subconscious mind. Um, that's what I'm sorry. What I'm trying to say is we could do that all the time, but recognize what it actually might be is all the information that's stored in the subconscious mind so that it's, it's ourselves. Like God is guiding us. It's God within it's, it's our own, uh, you know, subconscious that's, that's speaking to us and giving us this guidance and direction. So I'd argue we, we'd have to question the accuracy of, of what's coming oh, in oh, from I mean, our subconscious. Of course, the interpretation, that's the hardest part is it's so confusing and you're trying to – this is why I had to let go so much of my relationship with God as a Christian in the Christian context of monotheism was it was so confusing and I couldn't understand the signs and different – I had been led down so many different paths for seven years down making these life full life decisions, giving up everything, picking up, moving, being homeless, going to Bible college. Um, moving to Florida, all these different things that I thought God was leading me to do. And in hindsight, you know, it, it was like I was being led, I was being misled, but at the same time, I wouldn't know everything I know had I not experienced those things. So, but it's, it's incredibly confusing and distracting. And that's why I prefer, um, 
science and observation and, and reality now to to the mystical because what yeah. we're what we're talking about right now is a perfect segue to if we have Peter on the show again um, for the 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 mystical interpretation of things or or embracing the mystical experience which I think can be deceptive for exactly the reasons you're stating trick and exactly what I described this was a horribly traumatizing thing uh, that, that my, actually my mother was right there in the in the midst of and a nightmare for her hey, to, Papa, to find out what else. Yeah, isn't this exactly like what we were talking about in our hangout earlier today about how your your and your friend Peter Moriarty how he's kind of into the drugs, um, and like you're now uh, focused not on doing drugs, which given your experience now I fully understand that because because, because of my I had so many bad trips I had so many encounters with. What what I would call at the time demons and, and angels and and these these incredible mystical experiences where I was just literally the the drug had amplified you know in a symbolic way everything that was actually happening. I mean I could tell you guys stories I mean stories and stories, but anyway, but but with Peter his experience was entirely different. So he didn't come from a sort of fundamentalist background. Um, he he kind of was a was a mix of like Christian Gnosticism with Buddhism. And, and Hinduism, and he'll, I mean, he'll probably, you know, uh, add more to it if he explains it, but he sees these, these drugs and these hallucinogens as sort of portals and gateways and, 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 uh, and sort of initiating tools to, to tap into, um, to the divine and the mystical. And I'm saying, yeah, they can be, uh, but there's always consequences and there's always side effects and every drug has a side effect and a consequence has a negative consequence. So I am very much, I'm, I'm straight edge. I, I barely drink. I, I hardly ever drink. And I have very high ideals when it comes to how we treat our minds and our bodies and that we shouldn't pollute our bodies with anything that's toxic, whether it's food or, um, you know, or what we drink or what we, what we consume. Uh, I have very strong feelings about that. He has a more mystical approach, you know, where he thinks that all of these things that, you know, uh, cannabis should be legalized, that everybody should be able to explore and experience, you know, following but the kind Papa, of trajectory but you of, love- Papa, do you like Terrence McKenna and uh, Papa, do you extend you know, that to those physical? Guys. In other words, like you know, you're saying like if there's something wrong with our mind, let's say we're like having negative emotions and stuff, we shouldn't like resort to uh, psychotropic. But do you extend that to physical things? So there, there's a lot of physical ailments that we have that we've created these these completely artificial you know chemicals, drugs, and all that save our lives and make us healthy. So why why would it be like all right for the physical part of us and not all right for the psychological? Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're, we're talking about we're talking about the difference between ingesting, consuming uh, hallucinogens, psychotropic drugs that that alter your state of consciousness, and and um you know medicines and herbs and stuff that actually have. Uh, Effects on your on your symptoms on your on your physiology. We're talking in terms the same of, thing. In other words, like bodily like, functions. No, no, I mean LSD no, and, and DMT. It, it no, affects your it affects your perception. That's your mind. I you know, know what, but, the, but like for example, like with a lot of like brain um, pain conditions, it, it's all ultimately about uh, uh, emotion. It's about like how we feel and stuff. You know, so like sure, it's it's all biochemical. We're no we're neurophysiological, but it's the same thing. I mean, there's parts of us that physically don't work as well as they could should, and then there's these like you know physical chemicals. You but, know, treatments. Listen, and stuff. let me let me sum it up like this: we 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 should we should utilize all of Earth's resources in the sense that like like everything that we need for optimal health, the Earth provides. You know, I think I think that what, what you did. The but, problem but with your shouldn't... technique, Papa, was that you were doing yeah. it like in a non non medical, you know, kind of like a mode. It was kind of like very, you know, haphazard. It was random in a of sense. Course, of course, like, I was, if, it if was you recreational. Apply the medical, right? If you apply, apply the medical regimens and 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 protocols to this kind of like, um, you know, research, it, it could it could yield amazing results. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. I think we should research, uh, you know, the effects of LSD. Of, I've, I've read the studies where it, where it helps with depression and all this kind of stuff, and it's, but it's all about environment, and it's you know, be, be very careful with um, you know the, your state of mind when you do it, when you when you drop acid, when you when you take liquid or tabs or whatever, like like who's surrounding you, this like where you're at in your life at the time, like your like your um, your emotional states, all this stuff has to be taken into consideration, and for most people it's not. So as kind of a blanket generalization, I would I would just say that these drugs are bad. But of course, it's all in how you use it. I mean, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, cannabis is is amazing for uh, for glaucoma, you know, for cancer in, in some cases. But I'm what I'm against is uh, 
the dependency on it, using it as a crutch, using it as an, as an escape. And, and that's what more often than not ends up happening because most people, they just, they just want, you know, they don't, they don't want to think, they just want to, uh, to, to veg out and, and escape. And that's, I'm not, I think we should, um, absolutely, you know, uh, uh, pursue this on a scientific level and, and observe the effects and stuff. And they were much more open to this, like in the fifties and sixties, but then, you know, everything became about, um, the, the drug war and like sort of limiting, limiting uh, access to this because this is, if, if, and this is Peter's position, if, if doing acid and peyote and, um, psilocybin mushroom is going to, is going to expand your consciousness and help you feel one with everything and make you realize that, you know, you know, that, that so many of these, these social constructs are illusions and, and it will bring about a, a kind of, uh, a kind of a psychedelic revolution. They don't want that. They want you to stay stressed out and, and blind and dumbed down. And so they'll let us smoke cigarettes and, and use tobacco and caffeine and alcohol because those things are, are, are more physical and destructive. They don't, they don't actually expand your consciousness. So uh, it's totally like a, uh, an agenda by the government. So you follow what I'm trying to say? I'm, I'm not that against the exploration of it. Is that? Oh, yep. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it makes sense what you're saying there, Fafo. I'm not against the exploration. It should all be done in balance is what I'm saying. And so in a general sense, I, I don't – I would never – uh, pursue that. Like I would never eat meat again. You know, I would never, I would never do drugs again because I, I know what's happening there. It's, it's tapping into to my subconscious and it would screw me up because, and here's, the, I don't know if you guys will ever even understand this because I literally believed what I was seeing at the time. Okay. So if I ever end up thinking that way again, it's, it's very dangerous. I don't know if you know what it's like to have your entire reality sort of deconstructed and torn apart and put back together. And this actually happens, Chandler might know, with, with religion, with spirituality, like unlearning everything you've learned and then and completely being disillusioned. It's it's so it's so traumatizing. Oh right? yeah. It is it really is like that because in a sense when people are religiously indoctrinated under a system, they have an altered state of consciousness that that belief causes. And so in a sense it it's like being on a drug. Religion is kind of like a drug in that sense. And so I totally get what you're saying, Poffo. And, you know, in a way, your your interesting stories about being on drugs and all these experiences kind of did fit in with our podcast today in a sense because, you know, we're talking about experience. We're talking about how we actually experience things. And what's it's very interesting because this is important. How how we experience things and how we believe things, whether or not they are objectively, scientifically true, they do affect us. They do affect our behavior, and so I think these things are worth exploring. And you know, one one point I wanted to make, you know, 20 minutes ago, but you guys just kept going. I couldn't get a word in. Is that if we were able to access all, all of our memories at once and consciously sift through all of our memories stored in our subconscious, well then guess what? We would know like the causes of everything we're doing. We'd be we'd be hyper aware of the determinism at play. And under such a state, if that were possible, nobody would believe in free will because they would be fully aware of why what they were doing now was affected by this and this and this. That's a great point. Yeah. And you know that this this is what they – this is what, again, uh, maybe you call it anecdotal, but this is what people describe when they have their near-death experiences. They go through like a life review and they, and they um, talk about how they – instantly realize they recognize all the pain that they've caused they, they see the connections how one thing led to another how how each person they um they, whether meaning to or not you know like unconsciously they they affect it and they they can feel they experience what that other person felt this is exactly what people describe i mean hundreds what, of thousands what, of what's interesting about that is that like that you know what people report is reported through the lens of free will belief because people feel guilty and people feel, oh my God, I've done these terrible things. When the reality is like that, like they were made to do those things, so they they should really feel innocent while, while viewing all that. Or yeah. maybe on a certain level, or maybe on one one incredible level, everything is really one thing. Everyone is really one gigantic organism, so they can understand and relate because it's actually themselves that. They are just hurting another part of themselves, and on some level, maybe they can tap into it and and connect with that. You know, just like like people who are empathic, people who um you know can, can supposedly read minds and stuff. I mean, maybe that's what's happening there. It's it's an extension of our of our 
of our sensory input. It's it's human evolution. Yeah, I'm, and I'm you know, this reminds me of what I said in our hangout earlier today, and and George and Trick can can view that later because it's on my YouTube channel, where I was explaining how the understanding of determinism has enabled me to experience just for a moment being that other person and having their genetics and their experiences being them doing was that what they're doing and that is what enables me to love them in a sense realizing being able to identify with them being one in that sense and it comes through a philosophical understanding rather than through drugs maybe we yeah. maybe we, maybe we have sympathetic neurons because we're all one organism Maybe that's why uh, we have. I, would, I wouldn't go that far, but I, I would say that. Of yeah, course, you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, you're so left brain, <laughs> Trick. <laughs> it prompts us to to put ourselves in other people's shoes. Let's just put it that way. But but us all being one organism is a different thing altogether. So uh, it benefits us uh, because we're social animals and we we, we live in small you know small groups and yeah. uh, what we do to to one affects the whole and what they do. It, us. it depends like, though, like like, like uh, if Gaia. you're Trump, it is Gaia know. hypotheses. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that, it, that's what but, led to our, you know, understanding of climate change. Yeah, and that, guys, I really the Gaia need... hypothesis led to our understanding how, like, you know, everything's interconnected. Yeah, we we increase the carbon dioxide yeah. level, that, we increase the temperature. This, this is this is a different uh, the, a different podcast we have to get into again because obviously I think me and you spoke about Gaia before, George, but I I totally disagree against uh, with the Gaia hypothesis. So. It's pretty much standard science now. In the no, it isn't. It's not exactly standard what science. I said. It it's well, not exactly standard what I science. You, Stop right? saying that. I hate when people say that. Like, <laughs> well, well, guys, we've been going for two hours, first, and I really do need. Evolutionary biologists disagree with well, Gaia hypothesis. So yeah, well, yeah, I really do need to end this podcast. We have to be sympathetic. We have to be sympathetic to the other part of our body, Chandler here. Yeah. Who makes <laughs> yeah. Th this always this always happens. You know, I work every Monday, but I do this this thing on Sunday with you guys, and what happens is we end up we end up going so long, and I don't get enough sleep, and so th this is really messed up. Um, but yeah, and since since we were starting to kind of go off into other topics anyway, this is a good place to end. You you guys agree? Yeah. Sounds sure, good. Sure. All right. You've been listening to the Free Will Science Religion podcast, and we started talking about how our decisions are experienced in the subconscious, and it led to all sorts of stuff like drugs and Poffo's interesting stories he has to tell us. And I'm sure there'll be more of this in the future, and I hope that you learned something from this um, and enjoyed. Thank you for listening, and goodbye.